Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. My name is Tessa Archibald. I'm a policy associate for the Animal Welfare Institute, and I manage the Homeless People Versus Coalition. Just a couple of things to keep in mind as we get started. Please stay on mute so we can hear our speaker clearly. And this will be recorded. Uh, so if you have to hop off or if you want to share it, no worries. Many of you are today are joining as members of the Homes for Horses Coalition. But for those of you who aren't, I can share a short introduction. The Homes for Horses Coalition has been active since 2007 when it started as a unique coalition to help horse rescues and ultimately help equines by ending horse slaughter. Today, Homes for Horses is led by the Animal Welfare Institute and American Wild Horse Conservation and has over 500 members who are equine rescue directors, equine professionals, and equine advocates. HHG is dedicated to providing spaces for collaboration and connection within the equine rescue world, as well as furthering advocacy to improve the lives of equines through legislation and policy. Uh, one announcement, folks may be aware, uh, HHG has a conference upcoming in September. Uh, it's the 21st through the 23rd, so save the date. We should have registration info coming probably in the next week or two. Uh, we have such a great speaker joining us today, uh, Marcy Wild. She's here to talk about equine workload and weight limits. Uh, Marcy is a member of the Board of Directors of Horses and Humans Research Foundation, co-chair of their Equine Wellbeing Committee, and prior co-chair of the PATH International Equine Welfare Committee. As a lifelong equine advocate, she has been involved in the equine assisted services field for over 20 years and has presented and published articles internationally on equine welfare topics. Marcy has held positions as the director of equine assisted services at a large residential facility, an instructor and director of volunteer services at several premier accredited PATH centers. She has worked with the Equus Foundation and recently sat on the board of directors of Cornell Cooperative Extension, where she serves as an advisor for their equine programming. Incredible background and thank you so much, Marcy, for joining us today. Please take it away. And thank you for inviting me to present. It's really an honor to be here. So I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, which is a really good thing that all or most of you are involved in rescue and sanctuary, maybe rehabilitation and rehoming. And it's just heartening not to feel like I have to try hard to convince you about the value of our work towards shifting the general mindset from using the horse to working with a horse or partnering with a horse and the importance of helping people to focus on learning sound horsemanship and husbandry skills and to build trusting relationships with horses. So if we care about the long-term well-being of our horses, there is a huge difference between what a horse can carry and what he should carry. The Equine Wellbeing Committee of Horses and Humans Research Foundation is working to provide research-based information, education, guidelines, best practices, and options for horse owners and equine facilities to make informed, considerate decisions regarding weight carrying and workload for ridden horses. A primary goal of all horse owners and equestrian businesses should be the long-term emotional and physical well-being of their equines, which leads to sustainability at every level, for the equines and the homes or businesses that they're connected to. So we believe if it's not good for both the horse and the people, then it's not good for either one. When the horse is feeling safe and comfortable and is a willing partner, we, when he can express his natural curiosity and his desire for interaction, rather than just mechanically going through the motions, the benefit to all is enormous. The alternative to that is a shutdown horse one that robotically does as he's directed and stoically endures pain, discomfort, stress, and fear. And in these cases, if we treat the horse as if his feelings and needs don't matter, we're really better off using a mechanical horse-shaped device. If we regard the horse as a tool, how does that impact our thoughts and our actions? We know that horses are sentient beings and that they respond best in a situation of comfort, safety, and trust. So how often have we seen a horse that shows signs of distress and unwillingness to be ridden on a particular day, and the human says, yeah, too bad, pack them up, ride them anyway. Think about what messages we're giving to our staff and students and the people around us when we treat the horse as a mindless tool. So by mindfully working to minimize chronic stress in our horses, 
we're taking a huge step toward preventing the dreaded B word, that's burnout. And we're also doing our best to ensure longevity, health, willing participation, and engagement for both horse and rider. So the big question here, and before I do that, I just want to try to minimize this bar across the bottom because it's going to bother me. So more and hide floating. Okay, perfect. thank you. So is it possible that we can actually do this? So, oh no, and now it's not going. Now it's not going forward. I think that bar made the difference, and now I don't know how to get it back. Help. Um, do you want to try and exit out of the PowerPoint and open it back up again? I guess so. This is such a mess. Oh, there, okay, wait, there it is. I, I'm going to leave the bar because I think that bar has to be there. So we'll just carry on. So <laughs> is it possible to have a reliable formula to determine what a horse should carry? So wouldn't it be great if we had a simple, reliable, always applicable formula to guide our decisions? Sadly, research suggests that finding an appropriate weight carrying and workload formula uh, for our horses is just far too complex to work that way. So where did the commonly used formula that a horse can comfortably carry 20% of his own weight come from? I wish I could see you guys out there, but I'm afraid to mess with my screen, so I'm not gonna look. But I just wonder how many of you are familiar with this rule. I imagine most of you are, and I don't know if you know where it came from, but here's your hint. Um, in 1920, there's a US Cavalry Manual of Horse Management that combined the weight of the rider, all of the tack, all of the equipment, the horses were very well fit. They were well fit. They were fit. They were well trained and they were carefully selected. The riders were fit, well balanced, skilled equestrians. And I can't see this, but I think it says <laughs> overriding concern was really about winning the war. And nobody cared whether the horses came back and lived ha happy, healthy lives for a long time to come. So if you accept the rule that a horse can comfortably carry 20% of his own weight, then do you agree that a 2,500 pound draft horse can comfortably carry a rider who weighs 500 pounds? And take a good look at these two horses. Would you be comfortable applying the 20% rule to either or both of them? Obviously you're looking at the leg length of the horse on the left and the very poor muscling or zero muscling on the top line on the back of the horse on the right. So the quest for a formula goes on. A 2008 research study from Duty College in the UK published in the Journal of Veterinary Behavior concluded that horses performed best when their riders weighed no more than 10% of their horse's weight. This guideline, oh, we have to do the shock face here. So this guideline is used uh, widely in the UK and in most of Europe. So if we have this nice, neat little formula, can it really be that simple? So I Googled, and this is what I found. And I found this formula, so I decided to try it out. So we'll do the math. We'll take a 1,000 pound horse, a 350 pound rider with a 10 pound saddle and an eight inch circumference of cannon bone. And now we work out the numbers and we get 85, which I can't see, but I know it's there. and. The formula says that highlighted area on the left that the result should be between 75 and 85. So a one size fits all formula tells us that a 350 pound beginner rider with a 10 pound saddle is just fine to ride a thousand pound horse who might be 27 years old, a 3.5 on the Henneke body condition score in 90 degree heat, on deep sand footing for a one hour lesson, including tight turns, trot and canter work. And maybe it's his fifth lesson of the day. So is it possible to determine weight carrying and workload guidelines with the formula? Yeah, no, it's not. The solution doesn't lie in a predetermined chart or a preset formula. 
but rather in the understanding and the careful consideration of many complex and interwoven factors. So hopefully, and if I can get through the technology today, you will come away from this presentation with tools and knowledge and information based on well-documented evidence-based studies and research to feel more comfortable and competent in those situations and in advocating for all persons. So here are our challenges and goals. And I just have to say that is my no longer with us, but very much love for you there. Our challenges are to understand research-based findings, to share our knowledge, to dispel myths and mistaken beliefs, to create considerate evidence-based guidelines for weight carrying and workload for ridden horses. So this illustration is adorable, but this principle applies even to horses of similar build and age, because every horse is different, and even the same horse is different in different situations and under different conditions. So whether it's a saddle, workload, weight carrying, daily, weekly schedule, a horse's tolerance of stress or the impact of stress on the horse, one size never fits all. There are just too many intersecting variables. We're gonna look at each one separately and they are the rider, the horse, the tap, weather condition, terrain, including slope and footing, the nature, pace, and duration of the session, daily and probably says weekly workload, but I can't see it, and safety for rider, horse, and others. So starting with the rider, you wanna consider the rider's weight, their height, their body proportions, their muscle tone, their dynamic, and not just their static balance and their ability to accommodate to a horse's movement. And I'm sure we've all seen those people who look super balanced and great when the horse is at a halt. And then when the horse walks off, it all falls apart. We wanna look at their coordination, their level of fitness, their skill level, and their ability and their willingness to follow instructions, their ability and their willingness to demonstrate concern for the horse's well-being. And we know that all this can change over time. Thinking about tack, we know that some Western Australian or adaptive saddles can weigh well over 50 pounds. We need to consider the construction and the condition of the tack and the fit of the tack on the horse's current body and top line muscling, um, knowing that maybe it fit him really well six months ago, but it could have changed a lot in those six months. Look at the balance and the fit of the tack with the rider while he's mounting, when he's riding, when he's dismounting, the position that the rider adapts as a result of a particular saddle and stirrup configuration. If we look at our lovely gentleman on the right, yeah, we could drop the stirrup, but we're still not going to be balancing his weight well on that saddle, on that horse. And we need to consider the manner in which the saddle distributes the weight of the rider on the horse's back. So in addition to making sure that the saddle fits the horse and is well placed on the horse's back, the girth placement and tightness needs to be assessed to be sure it doesn't impede movement, it doesn't rub, and it's tightened appropriately. Saddles need to be checked for wear frequently. And of course, the saddle has to fit the rider and allow the rider to sit in proper alignment when you're mounted. So a saddle that appears to fit a horse well could become an instrument of torture under the weight of a heavy rider who is not able to maintain dynamic balance or who leans or twists in the saddle. If a rider is too large or too heavy for the saddle, if they sit crookedly, they rock, they shift in the saddle, or they land heavily on the horse's back, that can create severe pressure, pain, and physical damage to the fragile and sensitive areas like the spinous processes of the horse's back. So mounting and dismounting, when a heavy rider mounts from the ground, that can put enormous stress and pressure on the horse's back and withers. Looking at weather conditions, we consider the temperature, the humidity and dew point, the sun or shade, the wind direction and velocity, and it's really a combination of these factors and whether the horse is acclimated to those conditions. And terrain, we look at whether it's even or uneven ground. Is it level or sloping? Is it hard or soft and deep? Eh. And, oh, sorry. And <laughs> the altitude that the person's working at. Again, it's a combination of all these factors 
And is the horse accustomed to those conditions? So with the workload, we think about the length of time for each session. Is the horse doing repetitive work or varied work? What kind of intervals or breaks does he have between sessions? How many sessions does that horse work per day? And how many days does he work per week? What kinds of stressors are on that horse? And what is his quality of life? What is his turnout situation? Is he able to move about freely? Can he choose to spend time with equine companions or can he choose to get away from them if that's what he wants to do? And how is his diet? So looking at the nature, pace, and duration of the session, we know that all rides are not equal. A horse that might comfortably carry a larger rider on level good footing for half an hour at the walk might suffer significantly if he's asked to carry that very same rider, but for a longer period of time or on uneven or deep footing or up and down inclines or doing some trot or canter work. Think about whether the horse has an appropriate warm up and cool down and how much time is spent at each of the gates. And knowing that riding patterns working in straight lines and large figures is far less stressful on a horse than working in tight circles or in small patterns. So looking at the horse's age, according to Dr. Deb Bennett, PhD of the Equine Studies Institute, she says, quote, no horse of any breed or bloodline is mature before the age of five and a half. So I'm sure that all of us know a lot of horses who are in heavy work at the age of four or even under that. As horses age, their conformation often changes, their backs may drop, muscling along their top line may diminish, and the cumulative effects of long-term work may become more evident. We know that horses don't age at the same rate. We've all seen that 20-year-old who is fit and frisky, and we've also seen 20-year-olds who seem to be really old and tired. We can't change genetics, but lifestyle and diet are big factors, and we can change those. So looking at the breed, we're not saying that all individuals of a particular breed are the same, but there are characteristics, there are tendencies, and it's useful to know what that horse is bred for. Is it bred for endurance? Is it speed? Maybe short sprints? And we know that all draft horses actually are bred for pulling more than for carrying. And no brainer, feet are a critical element. We've all heard no hoof, no horse. The horse is born with the feet he's born with, but diet, good farrier care, and proper work can make a big difference. Looking at temperament, some horses are easily stressed or irritated or agitated, and others are stoic, and they may just suffer in silence. It's called learned helplessness. We can say that they're shut down, they just give up. And some people may see that as the horse is just happy and willing and compliant, and he's just fine with what he's doing. So there may not necessarily be immediate and obvious effects, but there can be subtle and cumulative effects. So we need to know our horses. We need to learn to recognize subtle cues. Sometimes it's just something that feels different, that just changes, and we may not be able to quantify it, but pay attention to those feelings because they matter. Overall health and soundness, I am preaching to the choir here, I know, but I'm just going to go through it anyway, that good husbandry and prevention are the key, that some conditions are progressive, some are chronic, some are totally preventable or curable, and some are treatable so that they allow the horse to continue to work in comfort. So again, obviously, work with your veterinarian, your farrier, your equine dentist and holistic practitioners to develop and implement a wellness plan for each horse and reassess it periodically. So this horse has the perfect confirmation. I wish I could see you guys because I want to see you raise your hands if any of you have one of those. And you're probably shaking your heads and me neither. Um, we're gonna talk more about confirmation later, but confirmation is super important in horse selection and it really should be a priority. So. Educate yourself and your team about correct angles and balances, and be aware of how confirmation will impact your horse's ability to work and how work will impact their soundness, their overall well being, and their longevity. 
So gates and balance are determined in part by a horse's conformation, their fitness, their training, and other factors. So it's not just about how the horse is built, but how he moves and how he moves while he's carrying the weight of a rider. Gates and balance influence a horse's ability to handle rider and tack weight and workloads and to thrive in their work. So I start, I presented this initially at Path International. I was gonna take this out, but I'm leaving it in and we'll go quickly through it. Just really important that your horses have break intervals between their work sessions. There's no right answer, but it's important to think about in terms of what the horses need. So what does a break look like? Is this a break? If the horse is tied in an aisle, he has a saddle, he has his little bonnet thing, he has leg wraps. Is this a break? Or is this a break? So when I was co-chair of the PATH International Equine Welfare Committee, our committee came up with these guidelines for a break for equines working in equine assisted services. And we found that any time an equine is not wearing any tack or equipment, is able to move about freely, has access to fresh water and forage, is able to choose to interact with other equines and is not being expected to respond to or engage with humans in any way. So the good old Texas A&M weight estimate formula. A horse's body weight alone cannot be used to determine his weight carrying ability, but a fairly accurate weight estimate is really useful in monitoring his health and determining quantities of feed or dosages for dewormers or medication. So this was fascinating to me. There was a University of Florida study made up of two groups. One had 77 horsemen with an average experience of 15 years working with horses, and the other was made up of 62 equine veterinarians. Both groups were asked to estimate the weight of five mature horses, which had been weighed just prior to the test, and they had the option of using a standard weight tape. This part is astounding. I, I was like boggled by this. So over 85% of both groups underestimated the horse's weights by an average of 150 to 185 pounds. They found no correlation at all between the years of experience and the accuracy of their guesses. So, this is not a promo for the University of Minnesota weight management app, but I think it's such an important thing. So it's sort of like a public service announcement. It's $1.99, you pay for it once. It's available for Android and Apple devices. And it is a remarkably accurate way to determine not only your horse's weight, but it will give you your horse's ideal body weight as well. So super useful thing to have. So I imagine that most of you are familiar with the Henneke body condition scoring system. It is a very useful tool. It looks at six points on the horse's body that are most responsive to accumulation of fat. It's a guideline for assessing whether a horse has acceptable flesh or fat cover. I'm sure you all know this, but one is emaciated, nine is obese, and somewhere in the range of five is considered ideal but it's important to recognize that this is again, only a measure of fat cut. So studies have shown that an overweight horse may suffer at least as many problems as an underweight horse when all the stresses on his body are considered. A fat horse is rarely a fit horse. Fat horses are at greater risk for exercise intolerance, founder of metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, the formation of colic causing lipomas, joint and bone problems, reduced reproduction efficiency, and increased stress on their lungs. And this is from the American Association of Equine Practitioners. So knowing this, do we really want to put a heavy rider, meaning 20% or more of the horse's weight, on an already overweight horse? So, a study from the Ohio State University um, Veterinary School, the equine faculty, found that overweight horses are more likely to suffer from metabolic issues, heat exhaustion, poor performance and joint problems such as arthritis. In one study, when horses carried more body fat, they had more movement asymmetry, yeah, more movement asymmetry, and underweight horses 
are more susceptible to disease and heal more slowly from injury. So it should already be crystal clear that using a horse's own weight as a basis for calculating how much weight he should carry is just totally unacceptable. So body condition, meaning fat cover, and top line score, which looks at muscling, are absolutely not the same thing. A survey of the American Association of Equine Practitioners showed that seven out of 10 equine veterinarians consider adequate muscling surrounding and supporting the equine's top line or their spine is the key to equine well-being. That same survey showed that 62% of equine veterinarians believe that a healthy top line is the key to fewer injuries. So I wish I could see you. I wonder how many of you are familiar with the top line evaluation scoring system. It's just so important to understand this and to use it. It was developed by my dear friend and my mentor, Don Capper and his team. And it's done with hands-on and visual assessment. It looks at three areas of the horse's back, um, the withers in the back, the loin, and the croup, and it, it determines the development of muscling all over the body. It's just easier to look at it at these points. So here is the chart. It's a really good chart. It scores from A to D. Initially, Don told me that they had it from A to F, and there were a few farm owners who had a real problem with that, so they modified it. Um, it is not just about appearance, and it's not like a report card where a B is pretty good. In a horse's top line, a B is definitely not good enough. Anything less than an A will mean that the horse is weaker, he has more soreness, his attitude and performance will be impacted, he'll tire more easily, there may be issues with saddle fit, and there's a greater possibility of long-term cum cumulative injury when he's in work. So this is a really clear visual that body condition score evaluates fat cover and the top line evaluation score evaluates muscle development. Body condition, we talked about it, ranges from one to nine. It's determined solely by calories and the top line evaluation score ranges from A through D and it's determined by bioavailable balanced amino acids. So it's, it's just a really important distinction that muscle and fat are not the same. And as we said before, unless a horse is emaciated or obese, the fat cover or the Henneke body condition score is of little use when determining weight carrying or workload limits. So this is just a good visual again. These horses are the same weight. If you look at the top line on the horse on the far left, he has fairly good fat cover but he has a very poorly developed top line. And on the right, he has good fat cover and an excellent top line. And there's a vast difference in the weight carrying abilities of these two horses. So here is your first quiz. So which horse is better suited to carry a heavy rider? Um, just take a look at these. There's no one right answer. There are many factors to consider. We just need to learn to gain the knowledge and make informed, responsible decisions. So the horse did not evolve to carry a human on his back. When we sit on a horse's back, we're weighing down the portion of his body where there's no direct support from underneath, like the span of a bridge. So looking at the left side illustration, that horse hollows his back and raises his head due to the forces of the weight of the rider. His pelvis tips forward, and the posture can cause damage and compression of the vertebra and many other problems. If you look at the horse on the right, when the horse engages his abdominal core, and when his pelvis tips downward, it lifts his spine under the rider, and it helps protect the vertebra from compression. It also allows his hind legs to step more deeply under his body mass and helps to support the weight of the rider, creating more thrust from behind more elevation in front, and makes him generally more maneuverable and more powerful under the rider's weight, and of course, less prone to injury. So looking at the center illustration, a quote from the article says, we may attempt to disguise the hollowness of the horse's spine when we ride by using the bit to make the most obvious part of it, the neck, 
come round. But this does nothing to prevent the back from sagging under our weight. It actually puts the spine under even more strain. So unfortunately, this is a common scenario in modern dressage and other disciplines where it seems like temporary appearances have more value than the horse's healthy working lifespan. So next quiz, true or false? A large horse is better suited to carry a heavy rider. It's false. Um, I can't read <laughs> the text on the left, but you can. So go ahead and read that. Um, it may seem counterintuitive at first, but research shows that as height goes up in horses, soundness, weight carrying ability, and degree of coordination and agility go way down. And this is from the research of Dr. Deb Bennett, PhD. She also found that draft horses are not particularly adapted to carrying heavy weight. The huge size does not, huge size does not confer weight carrying ability. Few tall horses over 16 hands are broad enough while at the same time staying within the ideal weight limit. Potential soundness goes way down as weight exceeds 1,450 pounds. So contrary to the common belief that larger horses can comfortably carry heavier riders, Dr. Bennett suggests that weight carrying ability is primarily a function of body breadth especially over the top of the loins, rather than function of height. So Dr. Deb Bennett's research, and again, she's the founder of the Equine Studies Institute and an expert in the biomechanics of horses, found that total weight of rider plus tack must not exceed 250 pounds. She says there is no horse alive of any breed, any build, anywhere that should go more than a few minutes with more weight on its back than this. So remember this research-backed advice. So in an article by Dr. Anna O'Brien, uh, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, she quotes Dr. Sam Hercomb, who has so many impressive credentials after his name, saying that workload is directly proportional to stress load and chronic stress leads to negative effects on the body. So the article mentions the following negative impacts of chronic exposure to elevated levels of stress hormones, and they are compromised overall health, pampered immune system, making the horse susceptible to diseases, slower healing, poor performance, weight loss, gastric ulcers and other digestive problems. And this is a very abbreviated list. So do you know how to recognize signs and, and respond to signs of stress and discomfort in your horses? This is the horse grimace scale. Um, of course, we need more acronyms in our lives. So it's the HGS. Um, it, um, has images and explanations for each of the six facial action units. And there we have another FAU, where in this chart, um, if it, the, it's not present at all, it's a score of zero. If it's moderately present, it's a score of one. If it's obviously present, it's a score of two. And there are other tools that look at the whole body and not just the face to assess pain and discomfort in horses. So you've probably heard the saying, ask two horsemen their opinions. And the only thing they'll agree on is that the third horseman is wrong. And ask nine horsemen a question and you'll get 10 opinions. So we know there are many different disciplines. There are different cultures and we don't generally tend to agree on a whole lot. So the social license to operate is a really hot topic these days. It's loosely defined as the court of public opinion, opinion, and I found volumes on this topic, and a lot of it was really complex and not very relevant here. But I found this, and this is from the International Federation of Icelandic Horse Associations. Um, SLO is another acronym, Social License to Operate, and I found these quotes that in order not to lose the equestrian SLO, social license to operate, the equine industry must 
gain or regain the trust of the public by truly protecting the welfare of horses. And ethics or ethical aspects of all practices must be examined and animal welfare must be prioritized. Any concerns about physical, mental, and social welfare should be taken seriously. Good example, examples of animal welfare should be promoted and horse safety or equipment and ground conditions should be, I'm not sure of the last word, probably considered. So I found this quote from the worldhorsewelfare.org. It says that the state of equestrianism social license is largely based on how well all those involved in horse sport and leisure safeguard equine welfare, as well as on public perception of how it's safeguarded. So I came across a public Facebook group about horses with 12,000 members, and I cut and pasted this. So here it is. He says, I knew this would be a controversial post. The picture is provocative because the rider is too heavy for the horse. I selected this picture from the internet to generate the kinds of posts that will lead to discussion. And discussion can be good. You know, it depends on the content, right? So he also said this, there is a horse for every rider. A lesson barn needs only one. So think about that. If a lesson barn is very busy, and they have a large number of heavy or large body riders all on that one horse. He also said that draft courses can easily carry 400 pounds. I suggest that those who feel as you do, which is that you care more than I and other professional horsemen care about horses, stop feeding your egos with this kind of carrying one upsmanship. People are as important as horses, if not more so in many circles. So yeah, people are important and it's obviously important to avoid fat shaming and to be respectful and considerate of people's feelings. We're not talking about people here, but I needed to say that and to emphasize the importance of striving to create a culture of knowledge, caring and consideration for horses and humans. This is not meant to disparage anyone, but to show that everyone has an opinion or more than one and so we need to look at the science and the rigorous research findings. So I will bring you back to the findings of Dr. Deb Bennett, which I can't see, but you can read. So I like this quote by Warwick Schiller, that every behavior has an underlying need. When you meet that need, instead of correcting the behavior, the behavior, and I'm gonna slip in the word usually, goes away. I also found these quotes from Krista Lestay Lasser from The Horse, The Journal, saying that pain is the most common reason that horses show unwanted behaviors, and that our sources estimate that more than two thirds of equine behavior issues are outward expressions of pain or fear of pain. So we've learned that large draft horses are not well suited to carry a heavy rider. But what traits should we be looking for that might indicate that a horse can comfortably carry a heavier, but not over 250 pound rider? So here are some desirable traits for a weight carrying ability. We wanna have a horse with an excellent loin coupling, broad, short, smooth, and strong. The circumference about the loin and groin about the same as the heart girth a short to medium back length, a neck set high on the shoulder, a shallow vertebral curve at the base of the neck, moderately high withers with a peak that lies well behind the horse's elbows, relatively short, thick cannon bones, a pelvis that constitutes at least 30% and I can't read the rest of it, so I'm gonna just let you guys read it. And one more about the weight being not more than 1,450 pounds. So these guidelines are for a riding horse and they would be different for a racehorse or a driving horse. And it's important to know that static posture is not at all the same as dynamic posture or the way that a horse uses himself. And that can often be modified through proper work and training. So going to the bottom line of the horse with a body weight of less than 1,450 pounds, think about that as it applies to drafters who are being ridden. 
So the loin is the lumbar region, which is equivalent to the lower back in humans. There are six lumbar vertebrae. There's no rib support in that part of the horse's body. And it's the weakest part of the equine back. So according to, Dr. <laughs> according to Dr. Deb Bennett, PhD of the Equine Study Institute, she says that although they have increased the animal's weight through selective breeding, draft horse producers have been unable to obtain a proportional increase in bone. And by bone, she means the circumference of the cannon bone just below the knee, as you see in the sketch in the middle. She says that no large draft horse possesses eight inches of cannon bone circumference, per thousand pounds of weight. So by this standard, a 2000 pound draft horse would have to have a 16 inch cannon bone circumference. So now I have my one and only prop. I hope you can see me. This is a roll of paper towel that is 16 inches in circumference. So I suggest that if you ever see a horse anywhere of any breed or type with a cannon bone of this circumference that you call the equine emergency vet immediately. Um, she goes on to say that statistics instead show that modern draft horses average only five inches of bone per thousand pounds or 10 inches of bone on a 2000 pound horse. So we're gonna look at some research and my colleagues warned me about not putting too many words on a slide, but I wanna provide you with tools and well-documented studies and research to be effective advocates for horses. So. Guilty as charged, I've got a lot of words. Um, so the effect of a rider's weight can actually triple during certain phases of the sitting trot as compared to the rider's weight at the walk. This quote is from equitation scientist and veterinarian Patricia DeCock's presentation on equine biomechanics. She says that when the, the effect of this force is added to the impact of the horse's own weight during movements with suspension, the magnitude of force on the horse's back, limbs, and feet is enormous. So musculoskeletal disorders rank first among the causes of wastage in performance horses. These musculoskeletal injuries are almost invariably caused by single or repetitive biomechanical overload, meaning weight bearing, weight carrying, sorry. 13 to 20% of all clinical problems in horses are related to lameness. These injuries have a negative effect on the health and welfare status of the horses and also represent a significant economic cost. Important causes of mechanical overload are the rider and the exercise intensity, meaning the workload. Riders have a crucial influence on the biomechanical load experienced by horses, especially long-term overloading can originate from inappropriate riding techniques, saddle fitting, I can't see the rest, but it's probably trimming and shoeing and ground characteristic. Um, studies again from Dr. Patricia DeCock found that the force exerted by a rider on a horse has a direct influence on the mechanical load experienced by the horse and consequently on its motion pattern. The rider's weight per se, even if lightweight, brings about an extension of the horse's thoracolumbar column that may cause injuries to soft tissues and eventually the kissing spine syndrome. A rude tension, both sudden and long lasting of the reins can cause back pain to a very frequent condition. I can't read the bottom, but in ridden horses. Um, a study by Akihiro Matsura, PhD of the Kitasato, I hope I'm pronouncing it well, University School of Veterinary Medicine in Japan, assessed the impact of weight loading on horses by measuring gait symmetry. He found that horses working in therapeutic riding classes are at particular risk of overload due to the fact that unbalanced riders seem heavier to horses. An article by Leslie Potter in Horse Illustrated eloquently states, Horses are often stoic. They will work through discomfort because they're bred and trained to do so. So just because a horse appears to be okay doesn't mean he's not overburdened. And that goes back to horses being shut down and burned out and seeming like they just don't care. A study done by Dr. Deborah Powell and her colleagues at The Ohio State University and published in the Journal of Equine Veterinary Science 
found that as a general conclusion, horses carrying over 20% of their own body weight exhibited increasingly high heart and respiratory rates during exercise and had more muscle soreness and tightness, some of which was measurable 48 hours later. <clears throat> they found that horses with wider loins and relatively thick cannon bones showed less soreness than horses of similar weight. The study noted that factors of confirmation, fitness, and nature all play a role. A research team at California State Polytechnic University, headed by Dr. Stephen Whitler, veterinarian and PhD, found that while carrying a single heavy rider on a one-day ride is not likely to seriously harm a horse. Over the years, a consistent regimen of this sort of work could add up to chronic injury. He said, just because a horse is not staggering under a hefty weight, it does not mean that the horse who seems able to bear a heavy load is not accruing silent injuries that will manifest years later as early arthritis. A study by Dr. Karen Wimbush, PhD, who's one of the researchers at The Ohio State University, found that the skill and balance of the rider are more influential than weight when it comes to the horse's comfort and soundness. Without a doubt, a quiet, balanced rider causes less stress to a horse than a busy or unbalanced rider. Rider weight is a factor as well, as the study proved, but a balanced rider centered over the horse's center of gravity is less stressful than an unbalanced rider. I'm going to improvise here because I can't see it, but even a heavier rider that is well-balanced is less stressful than a lighter rider that isn't as balanced. And I think these illustrations are great because you can really see that heavier rider perfectly balanced over the horse's center of gravity and the lighter weight rider who is really not balanced at all on her horse. A study by Kathleen Benton of the University of Tennessee Knoxville states that adding weight to a horse's back changes the curvature of the spine as well as the motion of the front legs. Over time, such changes in the horse's natural motion can cause back pain of clinical concern. And I can let you guys read the bottom. Um, so we'll move to the next one. Um, as eloquently stated, um, I can't read it, but in an Equus article, there is no simple answer it would seem except to err on the conservative side. So some considerations, we know that many horses will suffer in silence. So carefully monitor your horse's demeanor and facial expressions, their behavior and their movement, the angle, condition, and balance of their hoofs, their top line and weight, hydration, respiration, and heart rate, their attitude toward being approached, haltered, led, tacked, mounted, and ridden, Although it's unlikely that horses will suffer permanent damage from a single session with a heavier unbalanced rider, it's almost inevitable that over the long term, cumulative chronic injury, and you can read the rest, but that it will occur. So in conclusion, creating rider weight guidelines can be a particularly challenging and an emotionally charged endeavor because there are so many variables it's not possible to establish a set formula or a ratio to determine weight carrying guidelines for ridden horses. Many effects of excessive weight carrying are subtle and cumulative and may not be immediately evident, but they can have devastating long-term consequences. So by educating ourselves and others about weight carrying and workload considerations for ridden horses, we can become stronger, more effective equine advocates. We can enhance the immediate and long-term well-being of horses. We can help develop best practices that enhance the well-being and the longevity of ridden horses. And we can share our findings with others to promote better quality of life for horses across disciplines and geographic areas. I love this quote by Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. Thank you.